Jesus, you're my king. Your life brings me to see. I will praise you all my days. You're perfect in all your ways. Hail Jesus, you're my Lord. I will obey your word. I want to see your kingdom come. Not my will, but yours be done. Glory, glory to the Lamb. You take us into the land. We will conquer in your name. And proclaim that Jesus reigns. In your name and proclaim that Jesus reigns. We will conquer in your name and proclaim that Jesus reigns. Hail, hail, line of Judah. You're my king. Your life brings me to see. I will praise you all my days. You're perfect in all your ways. Hail Jesus, you're my Lord. I will obey your word. I want to see your kingdom come. in your name and proclaim that Jesus reigns. Hail, hail, line of Judah. How wonderful you are. Hail, hail, line of Judah. I tell you, if they were to be quiet, the stones themselves would begin shouting. Well, amen and amen and glory to his name. Again, there is no God like our God. This is Minister Pat Holmes coming to you again from the secret place. And again, decreeing the covenant blessings of the Lord upon you, your household, every situation and circumstance that pertains to you. Remember, Jesus is Lord. He's still on the throne. He still delights in intervening on behalf of us, his sheep. He's a good God tonight. The Lord is our shepherd. 
and we shall not want. Well, I am real anxious to jump into tonight's Bible study. I have to laugh myself as I think about it. I was driving uh, down the road the other day and just seeking the Lord as to what subject he would have me speak on next. And it was when I got to the nail shop that he downloaded the subject matter that I will share with you in just a moment. And I thought, oh my God. And I began to laugh and then I thought, well, I need to record it because sometimes I forget. You know, when you're in conversation with him and he downloads, sometimes you better record or you'll forget. And I thought, I can't speak that into my phone right here in the midst of all these people around me because the subject matter was palm reading. Can you imagine me speaking that out? Every All the eyes would have been on me. I'm going to talk about palm reading tonight, but we are not going to deal with the palm reading that the world is engaged in or involved in dealing with spirits of darkness. We're going to deal with the palms of the Savior. Oh, glory to God. I am going to share about five powerful things that I had never heard concerning the graven marks that were in his hands from those nails. You are so going to be blessed. I have wept as a result of just reading and studying on this. So tonight again we're engaging in palm reading by the Spirit of the Lord. We're dealing with the palms of the Savior. You know it is amazing and great leaders and great liberators and great vindicators. And in his case, he was our redeemer. They pay a horrific price to bring forth the plans, the blueprint of God. Oftentimes, the world does not understand, and in this case, the church world, the religious people did not understand. They did not know who he was, that he was a chosen vessel, or should I say many of them. There were those that were in empowered and enlightened by the Holy Spirit, and they knew who he was. So they pay a powerful, powerful price, oftentimes with their life, when they are sent by God to be liberators, glory to God, and vindicators. And so it was with the Lord. Well, we know that coming up in a few days is Palm Sunday. And it was on Palm Sunday, as you remember, they celebrated him in the city, and days later, they were crucify him. I want to talk at the beginning of this teaching concerning the palm trees. There are some interesting things concerning palm trees in scripture. I prepared this graphic and you see the letters highlighted in blue concerning palm trees and it tells about the characteristic of the date palms in Palestine and it says they are flourishing. And then another uh, characteristic or attribute of the palm tree, they are upright. That speaks of righteousness, being upright. The word flourishing to speaks of the blessings of the Lord. So that's why these trees were held in high esteem. And then the bottom part highlighted in blue says, branches are a symbol of victory. Now look at this scripture on the screen right below that most of us are familiar with. So 92 and verse 12. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. Oh, glory to God. So the palm tree again held in high esteem. And this is why when Jesus came into the city on what we celebrate as Palm Sunday, they waved those palm branches. It was symbolic. We celebrated that he was victorious and he would overcome death. I don't know if they knew all of that at the time, but we now know know it as we look back at history, look back in time. I want to give you a little history concerning palm trees. You remember prophetess Deborah? I call her that bad Deborah, bad to the bone. You can study her in uh, Judges chapter 4. Deborah was a judge in the days of old. So much of these people saying the Lord cannot use women. I still get to hear that. I'm like, are you serious? But that's another teaching. So Deborah sat on under a palm tree as the people would come to her. She was a judge and she would handle her cases seated under a palm tree. Again, the palm tree symbolic of upright, righteous, 
flourish and speaks of victory to glory to God. I'm sure they love going to Deborah under that palm tree. We find palm trees again in the writings of the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel was given a picture or a vision of the coming temple to be built. You know what he saw in there? He saw palm trees displayed on the walls in between cherubs. But there again, a symbol of the victorious palm tree. Victory, uprightness, righteousness. We're going to get this off of here and not mess up the whole screen as we deal with the palm tree. And then, of course, we come to this picture depicting Palm Sunday, when Jesus ran, uh, rode into the city on the donkey, as you remember, and you see there depicted the people are waving the palm branches. Again, the branches are symbolic of victory and symbolic of the fact that Jesus would overcome death. Now we're going to switch screens, and I am going to develop the five or six things that I told you the Holy Ghost shared with me concerning the engrave or the graven marks in his hand. Let me see what I have here. I want to tell you that this was prophesied way before it manifested. That's what I love about the Word of God, the Old Testament and the New. We've heard the term, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Here in the Old Testament is concealed what would manifest in the New Testament. This is the prophet Zechariah, and listen to what he prophesies here. He says, from him, this is speaking of Father God, from him comes the cornerstone. Oh, I want to pause on that. From Father God comes the cornerstone. It was God himself that sent the building block. Glory to God. I pray you have built your house, your home, your spiritual temple on that cornerstone. From him comes the cornerstone. From him the tent peg. And that's what I'm going to deal with tonight. From him the tent peg. Let me tell you about the tent peg. When they would erect the tents in the days of old, that tent peg, it was the main nail or the main stake, and they would hang their instruments in that tent on that tent peg, being the main device for securing. Jesus here is called the tent peg. Did he not secure it all? Is it not him that it all hangs on? Our salvation, glory to God, our strength, our deliverance, our healing, our breakthrough is all hanging on the tent peg. His name is Jesus, glory to God. Going to talk about that tent peg a little later. Well, let me just share it right now because I love that bad JL. JL and Deborah worked together, if you remember, in the book of Judges. They were hanging and pick and chosen by God to carry out a powerful, powerful assignment of bringing down the enemy. Oh my goodness. And we know that Barak worked with them on that assignment. He was actually the, the soldier, that the captain of the battle. But this is what I want to bring out. I don't want to get into Deborah's and J.L.'s whole story. But you remember the story. It was J.L. that when the enemy ran up into her tent, the Bible says this about Jael, that she took the nail, which was the tent peg in one hand, and it says she took the workman's hammer. I want you to pay attention to that. The workman's hammer in her right hand. She drove that stake, that tent peg, through the head of the enemy, Caesarea. We're talking about applying this to spiritual battles. I am not in, in any way speaking of driving a tent peg through your enemy's head in the natural. But in the natural, it happened in the days of old because it was eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But in the realm of the spirit, that tent peg representative of Jesus, the nails that were in his hand, the price that he paid, the one that secures and holds it all together, the one that we can trust in, glory to God. Through him, we can drive a stake through the enemy's head in the realm of the spirit and stop 
what the enemy is doing in our life. It's all hanging on him. Again, he's the tent pig. He holds it all together. Now we look at uh, Zechariah, the next uh, part of the verse. It says, from him the battle bow. I thought about that scripture that David wrote. It is God who trains my hands for battle, my arms to bend a rod, uh, to bend a bow. I think it was a bow of steel, but it speaks of warfare. You know, they shot with those bow and arrows, and David said, it is God who trains my hands for battle. So concerning Jesus, it says from him, the battle bow. You know, the scripture uses the term, the arrows of the Lord. Oh, glory to God. I want you to know he has empowered us, the child of God, with warfare tools. Glory to God. Weapons of warfare. Glory to God, where we can stand on this battlefield and do damage to the enemy's kingdom. You know, he's a liberator, and he has put that liberating mantle upon us through prayer, through fasting. We can bring forth, uh, bring out of prison, bring out of bondage our loved ones and others that we pray for in the body of Christ, because the liberator's anointing and mantle is upon us, the children of God. And it says, even he him, every ruler together. All rulers, glory to God, that are sent by him, they come forth from him. So we wanted to show you in the Old Testament that what was done, manifested, fulfilled in the New Testament, it had already been prophesied. I wanted to put a picture here. We see it on my backdrop, but I wanted to put one where you can really see it because we're going to talk about those graven marks in his hands. I'm going to deal with the scripture in just a moment. And again, we're going to develop that and some insight concerning those graven marks. I want to show you this again, an Old Testament prophecy, letting you know that was what was fulfilled by Jesus in the New Testament had already been prophesied in the Old. This is the prophet Jeremiah. And look what the Lord told him. Uh, the J fell off of Jeremiah in my copying and pasting. But in Jeremiah 31 and 32, it says, not according to God in the verse before, he said he was going to bring forth a new covenant. And, and we know that the Old Testament or the Old Covenant has been fulfilled, but there was a new covenant that was brought forth. And I want to throw this in concerning the new covenant. I, I love this, this analogy the Lord gave me years ago. If we were to build a new house and we're leaving out of the old house, there are some things that would get transferred over into that new house. And there are some things that would be totally fulfilled, done away with, no use for that anymore. And so it was concerning the ceremonial laws in the Old Testament, the ceremonial laws. We don't have to come to church and bring a bullock or bring a ram of any of that. Jesus paid the price with what he did with his redemption work on the cross. But there are some things that are still that have been transferred over over into the new covenant. Even as he said in the old covenant, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. We can find nine of those ten commandments over in the New Testament. The one that cannot be found is the one concerning the Sabbath day. That's the teaching all by itself. There's a scripture in the New Testament that tells us to judge no man according to which day that man would keep holy. But I'll teach on that at another day. Here we're going to deal with what Jeremiah was given in this prophetic release. And God was going to do a new thing. And this is what I want to read for you. He said, not according to the covenant that I had with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand, I like that, to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. And we know that they, they couldn't, uh, they had a hard time obeying the covenant of the Old Testament. They had a hard time obeying those laws. And this is why he did a new thing. Let me go on and read it and confirm what I'm saying. And it says, though 
I was a husband unto them, says the Lord. Now look at verse 33. Here's the covenant promise. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. Oh, glory to God. Let me say that again. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now you look at that word, write it in their hearts, because I am going to deal with this picture on the screen, graven imagery. I'm going to deal with inscription and all of that, and it's all going to be hanging on the nail pig, or the tent pig, glory to God, one of the names for Jesus. Now let me pull up... Uh, page one of my outline. I've already shared the top part. So I'm going to go right here to the middle to Isaiah 49 and verse 16. And this is the imagery that I will develop from this scripture. It says, Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Let me say that again. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Now this is a prophetic word to the chosen people of Israel. We the Gentiles, if you're not a Jew tonight, listen to me, you're Gentile. We Gentiles were grafted into the vine. The promises that were given them now belong to us because of that tent peg, Jesus, and the price that he paid. Everything, the whole redemption plan hung on him. The main nail or the main security in the tent and he is that in our tabernacle oh glory to God so here's the that's the scripture I'm going to develop and uh, I already developed concerning the tent pig but let's just run over it again what the prophet Zechariah said concerning Jesus says from him which is from father God comes the cornerstone we know Jesus is the cornerstone and then from him the tent pig and then there's the back Bow, and then, of course, all of the leaders that he says, I mean, the last part, uh, from them, every ruler together. But I'm going to go, let's just read these notes, even though I've already mentioned it. I want you to see it with your eyes, and it will help you remember. Here, highlighted in yellow, it says, The large pig inside an oriental tent, it says, on which is hung most of its valuable furniture. And then it goes on to say, it represents a Messiah. It says, on Messiah hung all the glory and hope of his people. Oh, I want to say Selah. Pause and think about it. On Messiah, who is the tent peg, hangs all the glory and hope of his people. And then I have there on my notes reference J reference JL, and I already mentioned her. That bad, bold JL, that mighty warrior on the battlefield. You remember Caesarea in the midst of battle, the enemy ran up in her tent and asked for water. She gave him some milk. We know milk has milk melatonin in it. Is it melatonin or melatonin? However you pronounce it. It has a type of common and sleeping agent in it. And she gave him milk instead of water. And when he went to sleep, the enemy went to sleep right there in her tent. She drove that tent stake, that tent peg, right through his temple. We're talking about Jesus who empowers us, who trains our hands for battle and our arms to be in a bow of steel. And we go down here to the word crucified. Look at the meaning of the word crucified. We're developing those nail scars in his hand. The graven image that was in his hand. And the word crucified, do you see it? It means to stake. It means to drive down stakes. Oh my goodness. The only time that the word nails was used in the Old Testament, I was surprised. I was looking this up the other day, and it was when uh, Thomas said, uh, I won't believe it unless I see the nails 
the prints that were in his hand, but the word nails is used in that scripture. But here, the word crucify again, the word crucify, isn't that powerful? To drive down stakes. And that is exactly what was done concerning Jesus. Now, I am getting ready to share with you the four things, I believe it's four or five, concerning those nail prints that were in his hand. Again, pay attention where it says Isaiah 49 and 16 in the middle. It says, Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hand. And I am going to deal with that word graven and wait till you hear these points. Dealing with the word graven. I was so blessed when I studied this out. First of all, look at the top. You see that the primary, the primary meaning of the word graven, it means to cut. And it is used um, uh, concerning cutting a tomb out of a rock. And there's a scripture, Isaiah 22 and 16, you can refer to that talks about a man that was cutting a tomb out of a rock. But I want to tell you how that applied to Jesus prophetically. Glory to God. Cutting a tomb out of a rock. The word graven that was speaking of the graven marks in his hand. Uh, the primary meaning, cutting a tomb out of a rock. In the plan of God. God had already used, if you remember in the scripture, Joseph of Arimathea to purchase a tomb carved out of a rock. Arimathea did not know when he purchased that tomb and when he had that tomb carved out of that rock, a cut out of that rock, he had no idea that the Messiah would borrow that tomb for just a little while. Oh, glory to God. So the primary meaning of the word graven, which refers to the marks in his hand, has to do with, again, the cutting out of a tomb from a rock. Oh, the plan of God includes all of us. Again, Joseph of Arimathea, the rich man, his tomb would belong to Jesus. Jesus had to go in that tomb because he had to be there in death and be there when resurrection life would invade his body in that tomb. And that resurrection life he purchased for you and he purchased for me because on that day, Glory to God. Resurrection power will hit our bodies wherever they have been placed in barrel. And we shall receive those new glorified bodies. So Jesus had to go in that tomb. That tomb that had been carved out of a rock. The rock itself symbolic of Jesus. See it's all based on him. The nail peg, the stake, the security in our tabernacle. The whole plan of God. Then as we go down on the outline we're dealing again with the word graven. He said I have graven you in the palms of my hand. Listen to the meaning of the the word graven. I have it highlighted here in yellow. It means an engraving or a writing. And I have a scripture there that you can reference in Psalms 30 and, and verse 8, but I highlighted the word note. Do you see that? Let me just read it. It says, now go, write it before them in a table. And it says, and note that word note means graven. Note it in a book. So the word again, graven, dealing with those graven marks in his hand has to do with writing. It has to do with engraving. It said write it in a book. I thought about Moses when he was up in the mount with Father God and you remember the table of stone. There was a writing on that table of stone. All that pointed to the future Future. Jesus, the one that would come forth, the one who is the word, the one who is the law, as you see in my notes highlighted in yellow. So the word graven, again, first of all at the top, because I don't want you to miss this, I want you every time in the future when you see those nail scars in his hand, the graven mark, think of the fact that it pointed to the graven or the cutting out of a tomb in a rock. He had to go in that tomb 
tomb, but that he had to get up for you and for me. He was the first fruit. And then it points to glory to God, inscribing, engraving, and it points to a writing. And then, oh, I'm just now reminded right now of the handwriting on the wall. You remember that in the Old Testament when the hand of God, the partial hand of God appeared on the wall when they were in there, the, the heathen uh, were celebrated. It was Belshazzar. Belshazzar was having a party and they had all, already taken God's chosen people imprisoned them, taking them captive into their land, and they robbed the precious things out of the temple of God. They took the holy vessels, the holy cups and plates, things that had been dedicated to the Lord, and there they were having a party, celebrating using utensils out of the house of God. And if you remember, a hand appeared on the wall and began to write. All of that points to Jesus, the main nail Pig. So again, point number two brought out that it pertains to writing. It pertains to inscribing. And we know that story. When Belshazzar saw that hand writing on the wall, the Bible says how his knees began to buckle and shake. And it wasn't long after that that his uh, kingdom, he was overthrown. Oh my goodness, we can't play with God. And then as we look down on the notes, let me see. Oh yes, uh, right there in the middle, it says it is used, I love this, for decreeing or inscribing. And then I have the word law highlighted in gray. This pertains to the law. Again, the graven image in his hand. One of the meanings, it is used for decreeing and inscribing the law. And we know that the law is settled. Oh, glory to God. Uh, from that comes the word statue. And I love that word because the statue has to do with the, the decreed limitations of God. There is a scripture in Jeremiah. I don't know if I put it up here, but it is a powerful scripture where Jeremiah Maya, speaking on behalf of God, uh, released a complaint to God's chosen people. And in that scripture, uh, God says to the people concerning the boundaries of the sea, he say uh, they're under a statute. They're under decreed limit. The sea knows to go that far and it has to come back right into those boundaries that I have decreed around it. He said, but my people Oh, my people, they do not know my decreed limits and my statute. My people would do anything. And that is so, so true today. People that are saying, tell you, oh, I love God. I serve God. But they're living exactly like the world. No difference between the world's lifestyle and theirs, except they go to church on Sunday morning to appease themselves. We got to sell out, be delivered by the hand those nail prints in the hands of the Savior. Those nail prints were placed there for you and they were placed there for me to help bring deliverance, glory to God, with the power of the Holy Ghost. We have to stop playing with God. He sees all and he knows all. <coughs> Excuse me. So number three, the point that we've just made concerning those gravens in his hand, it has to do with decreeing and it has to do with inscribing. Uh, I did have that scripture on there where it talked about the sea and the, uh, Jeremiah used the word by perpetual decree forever. How the way the Lord has established the seas and the boundaries around the sea. But he said his people, they don't pay attention to statutes and boundaries and, and many don't. Uh, we look right here at let me see, I have here Proverbs 8 and 27. And you see underlined the word set. Let me read it. It says, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. This is wisdom talking, or personified in, in this proverb. I was there. When he set, that word set, as you see, means graven, set a compass upon the face of the depth. Oh, my goodness. We're dealing with perpetual decree. We're dealing with the word graven, the image graven in his hand. It has to do with perpetual decrees. For God has established. The Bible says heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. 
Oh my goodness. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. This world and they that dwell within. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods by perpetual decree. We do know that the time will come when earth will roll up, fall up, be done away with because John the Apostle said, I saw a new heaven and I saw a new earth. But that's in the future. Right now, the ownership belongs to him and shall always belong to him. The next point I want to make, we're dealing with the word graven, the, referring to the scars in his hand and what it refers to. And it says... Ah, uh, a commander of decrees. Oh, I like that. A commander of decrees. That is nobody but Jesus. He is the commander of decrees. I want to go here to the highlighted part below in this scripture, and you see the word lawgiver. The word lawgiver, when you look it up, it is the same word used for the word graven, the word lawgiver. He is the lawgiver. He paid the price, glory to God. And again, that scripture that he gave us, let me go back to that. What did he promise us? Here, Isaiah 49 and 16 in the middle of the page. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Now that has to do with whatever is going on in the city. That was the promise to the people. But now it applies to all of us. Whatever is going on concerning us, our situations, our circumstances, he said it is forever before him. Pause and think about that. He sees right now whatever situation you're going through. And not only that, he has mercy upon us. The Bible says his mercy endures forever. That's why we can trust in that nail pig. Everything hangs on him. The promises of the word. He paid the price with his blood. Glory to God. And he said his word is exalted above his name. That that was inscribed. Glory to God. He that was carved. Had a tomb carved out of a rock. Again so that he can go in there. And resurrection power could be released. He purchased that for each one of us. I tell you what, when we leave here, we are headed for a wonderful place. Eyes have not seen, he said. Ears have not heard. Neither has entered into the heart of man all that God has prepared for us. We're talking about the graven image that was in his hand. Let me pull this up so that we can just look at that again. Look at those scars that were in his hand. He paid the price. And again, it was prophesied, remember, by Zechariah in the Old Testament concerning from Father God would come that pig, would come that stake pig, that nail pig. It was all staked in him. Aren't you glad that he stayed there? <clears throat> you know the scripture teaches us that he could have come down from that cross. He could have summoned forth a whole legion of angels, but he chose not to because he wanted to fulfill the plan of God. He did it for you. He did it for me. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the teaching of this word, Lord God. We thank you that tonight we have read the message in the palm, the true message, Lord God, that you allowed the tent peg sized nail to be driven into the palms of your hand. And now everything hangs on that, every tabernacle here on earth. And we are your tabernacle. We can trust in that price that you pay. There are others that serve other little G-O-D-S, but there's only one true and living God. And his son, Jesus, that came, walked among us, then surrendered his life on the old rugged cross, and then set forth the comforter when he left to help keep us, maintain us, teach us, sustain us, strengthen us, empower us, so that we can stand on this battlefield. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. And where he leads, 
me, I will follow. Sing it with me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him all the way. Father, we thank you for the teaching of this word. The subject was palm reading, the message that's in the palm. Oh, Lord God, may we revisit the palms, the price that you paid. May we be reassured this night that you have secured us all in you that you said you'll never forget us. We are graven on the palms of your hand. Father, I speak that to the one that's downtrodden tonight. Feel like they've been cast away. Remember, child of God, he is with you. He said he won't forget you, that you are graven on the palm of his hand. And those palms are upright palm. They are powerful palm. They are just palm. They are palms that are full of mercy, palms full of grace, palms full of deliverance power, palms that would never leave you, palms that would never forsake you, palms that were laid on the sick in the days of old and they got up. That's the God that you and I serve. No other God can boast of that. Oh, hallelujah. We bless your name, Lord God. Well, I want to sign, I wanted to be sure you see my little lamb here on my headband. It's that season again and we're honoring the lamb that came, the one again that the nail pegs were in his hand. That's the one we serve. This is Minister Pat Hall, home signing off. And until next time, I want to say shalom, which means peace that comes from the nail pegs also. God bless.